brothers and sisters, and welcome back to another awesome episode of Gothically Yours, Professor M. I'm Professor M. And today I'm going to be tackling that age-old question. Why and how did the goth community subculture survive over 40 years and still thrives to this very day? Join me. Now, before I begin my talk today, doing my Gothic lectures, I'm going to share with you a little bit about the human psyche. What is that, Professor M? Well, the human psyche is the thing within us, and the compelling reason that we, as human beings, also have an interest, or curiosity, or sometimes a craving for the dark psyche. The dark psyche is things that are how does one say, not mainstream. And this curiosity is a part of the energy which has compelled the Gothic community for the last 40 years. I'm going to take you on a journey now through 40 years worth of history and put it in a nutshell for you. I'm going to talk about three waves, the first wave, the second wave, and the third wave of Gothic music. And I'm also going to talk today about fashion, <laughs> and I'm going to talk about the Gothic subculture as an entity. So let's talk about the three waves. What are the three waves, Professor M? Well, there are three waves within our goth subculture. There is the first wave, the second wave, and the third wave. They're divided into time periods. I, being 51 now, am a part of the first wave. And if you are an elder goth and have been a part of the first wave of gothic music, please leave me a comment down below. I'd love to talk to you about the early 70s and 80s. The second wave has to deal with the 90s to the 2000s, and the third wave is from the 2000s all the way up to the 2020s. Within these three waves, the continuum and transformation of the goth subculture has been evolving. This is also a trajectory as to why the goth community has survived for nearly 40 years, or I should say, over 40 years. So let's talk a little bit about wave number one. What is wave number one? Well, wave number one starts at the end of the post-punk movement. This was the beginning of, I would probably say, the four most influential bands in the goth community that we have at the early Big Bang of Gotham. I would say they were The Cure, Suzy Sue and the Banshees, Bauhaus, and Joy Division. Within those four, you have this pillar in which all of the other gothic cultures stand on top of it. So the sound of the cure, the sound of Susie and the Banshees, the sound of Bauhaus, and the sound of Joy Division were the equal creations to opening up a new branch of music, which just couldn't be labeled as post-punk anymore because it was getting a little bit more darker, a little bit more unique in style and culture and entities. So let's talk about a few of these bands. Let's talk about The Cure first. If you are a big fan of The Cure like I am, you will notice that The Cure had a major impact on the goth community, even though they would deny that they had anything to do with gothdom at all. They're so goth. They're not even goth anymore. <laughs> I want to talk about two important band members. The first one is Robert Smith, of course, being the lead singer, and also Lowell Torhost, who wrote a book called Cured, a must-read for any goth. You should have this book on your gothic library bookshelf. An absolute must-read. I'm 75% of the way through this book, and I'm going to give a full book review on this in another video. However, look how, look how young they were. 
So cool. Cured is a very important book because it shares with you a lot about the things that you would never, ever, ever know about the cure. And he even talks about the goth subculture and how they had a major impact it on the, uh, the goth subculture without even knowing that they were doing what they were doing. Interesting enough, Robert Smith did not want the band to die, and Robert and Lowell were friends since kindergarten. This is how far back the beginning of The Cure is. So there's a lot of birthdom going on here. Another important aspect of The Cure is hair, eyes, and makeup. Did Robert Smith make a massive impact on the Cure's look that spread through Gothic communities around the world? Absolutely. But he also influenced the band members to follow his look. And we're going to talk about another band who also caused that influence of makeup, Susie Sue and the Banshees. So let me now talk about Susie Sue. Oh my goodness. Where would we be without Susie Sue and her Egyptian eyes? My goodness. She was a major impact on the Cure's look herself, coming out of the post-punk movement and dealing with another band by the name, uh, a band member by the name of Steve Severin. And she also had another band member by the name of Budgie, who she married. Now, if you know your goth history, you will discover that Robert Smith from The Cure also did some gigs with the Banshees, but Lowell, who wrote in his book, knew that Robert was very, very dedicated only to The Cure and was not going to leave the band to become one of the Banshees. But during that time, Susie Sue's influence on Robert was so strong because of look and personification. Now what does this have to do with the goth subculture? That personification is going through our community even to this day, 40 years later. 40 years later, we still have that look flowing through. We've called traditional goth or trad goth, but it branched out and through evolution created a completely different world. Now, with that being said, let's talk about two more bands, Joy Division and Bauhaus. There's always time for tea. I'm going to be taking the last two bands and fusing them together, Bauhaus and Joy Division. Now, if you know your Gothic history and you know Bela Lugosi's Dead being one of our first anthems of the Gothology world, you will discover that Bauhaus, which also branched out into a band called Love and Rockets, which I will talk to you a little bit about later. However, uh, Joy Division and Bauhaus were at the beginning of the beginning of the goth subculture that we know today. Bela Lugosi's Dead 7, 8, 10, 25 minute song created a revolution and this impacted not only Susie Sue but Robert Smith at the time. What is Love and Rockets? Well, Love and Rockets was an offshoot of the Bauhaus days. And I have to, to mention while here, in 1981, when MTV first came out, and I was there on HBO and all those other programs watching that on a box thing that you hooked up to a thing called cable at the time, MTV was the beginning of showing us these alternative bands, but they were only shown outside of the whole Madonna and Michael Jackson, Duran Duran world of the 80s MTV thing. There was a special area that was put for alternative music called 120 Minutes, hosted by a guy by the name of Dave. Mm. And he would talk about these bands, the Cure, uh, Susie Sue, uh, Ecstasy, um, Love and Rockets, uh, Nights or Ebb. I'm trying to think. There was a host of other bands that I mean I could just list right here that they played late at night. You would have to see these things at like two o'clock in the morning. But I was 
watching them because this was a part of the beginning of the beginning. So that is the talk about the first wave, the four bands that really influenced the first wave of Gothology. And this is, sets the foundation for the second and third wave. So let's talk about that. So what is the second wave? Well, at the end of the first wave, two more bands start to emerge. The first one was called Sisters of Mercy. And if you're a very big fan of them, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And the other one was Fields of Nephilim. These two bands now created a darker sound, much more darker, which created an evolutionary force which pours over into the second wave. Now, what is the second wave? Well, I'm quite sure there are a lot of bands you've never heard of from the second wave. And I'm going to make a list over here on either side so you can start seeing some of these bands. Probably saying, Professor M, I've never even heard of or seen these bands before. Good. Go out and research them. Find new music and discover a very, very unique historical, historical and very, very important sound of the second wave. Now, I want to share with you something. If you've never seen this book before, it's called Encyclopedia Gothica, written by Lisa Lassiter. And in the back of the book, no, I'm not going to show you. I want you to go out and buy the book, because this also should be on your Gothic bookshelf. She has in the back, excuse me while I take a moment to open it up, here it is. Uh, in the back of this book, there is a family tree. It is a large family tree. And she lists punk, new romantics, industrial, psychobilly, post-punk, bat cave, synth pop, death rock, dark cabaret, goth metal, goth rock, dark wave, ethereal, and industrial metal. This is the gothic family tree. And there are bands that you have heard about, and there are bands that you have not heard heard about. I'm just going to share with you some bands that you might have heard about, and some of these will be from the second wave. Now, we talked about The Cure already, but how about these other bands? The Fall, Gang of Four, Killing Joke, Birthday Party, uh, The Cramps, Mad Sin, Horror Pops, Zombia and the Skeletons, Jill Tracy, Emily Autumn. Now, I've, I've, I've listened to her before. I've actually enjoyed a couple of those. Um, Christian Death, 45 Rave, Lycia, Faith and the Muse. Oh, I, I love this woman's voice. Oh, my gosh. Cock Two Twins. I'm a dedicated, dedicated fan. Elizabeth Frazier, if you're within the sound of my voice, I love you. Oh, my gosh. Anyways, there were so many bands. Uh, she also adds a cultural piece over here. She wrote Nine Inch Nails. Now, Nine Inch Nails, I would not consider uh, to be a goth band. I would put that in industrial. However, it is a major influence in the third wave, if you can consider that. I've had other individuals say to you, uh, do you think Nine Inch Nails is goth? Do you think that... Uh, Marilyn Manson is goth. Do you think that, um, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the answer to that is no, they are not goth. They are uh, dark, industrial, or they have their own okie finoki swamp that they fit into. So that is the second wave. And the second wave began from about the end of the late 1980s all the way to the 19. 90s. And I was in college at this time, and all of these bands were erupting all around me, and I had no idea what they were. But influentially, I had other friends and goth members that I went to clubs with that were exposing me to bands that were very alternative. I remember another band called Flesh for Lulu, whether or not you want to actually call them. And I'm trying to think of a few others, which I'll list over here. But all of these bands were all around me. And this is a part of the second wave. So let's now talk about the third wave. 
What is important to know is the third wave of music takes place in the 2000s. But what is still driving us to this day? Let's talk about some of the bands that made impact. Ooh, let's go back to the first wave. The Cure, Suzy Sue, Joy Division, and Bauhaus. Now, there are all types of bands that have emerged from the third wave. Right now, as an elder goth, I am listening to several bands that I love, and I can post some over here. However, there's one particular band that I have been following very much. It is called Male Tears. They just completed their third album, I believe, called The Crypt, or Crypt, and I'm hot to get it. If I can get a hand on it, it is pressed in vinyl. James, Frank, I love you guys for doing that. How beautiful. Anyways, check them out. Another thing is that the third wave is a part of the influential area that is driven through fashion. Now comes the part of my lecture about fashion and why the influence of the goth subculture still exists to this day. As a goth influencer, I can tell you completely that fashion is a major part of the goth community and subculture to this day. From the beginning of the large hairstyles and the makeup and the way that we style each other, right up through the influence that the Adams family has had blending in there. During the second wave, what was very important was a rise of Anne Rice's books, which poured out a whole entire community of vampires. The vampire influence on the goth community in the second wave, not only taking over from trad goth, but blended in with this new vampire craze erupted and evolved into a completely new look. Now, if any of my goth sisters out there follow the Morticia Adams look, you will know precisely what I'm talking about. There is something wonderful about the blending and the fusion of the Adamses and the vampires. A touch of industrial there and a bit of grunge being compiled. This is a part of the third wave and an eruption of fashion. So let's talk about the three waves of fashion now within the goth community. The first wave is the trad goth look from the bat cave. Again, the large hair and the makeup. And the second wave is the fusion of vampires. And the third wave is where it still becomes very, very obvious that the goth community is surviving today because it is branching off and branching off and branching off. It is evolving in style. We have a massive range at the top of the tree of nearly 20 new branches that were formed from the second wave, which started off from the beginning of the first wave. So if you look at it, it goes something like this. The first wave, the second wave, and the third wave. This huge industrial and change in style and fusion culture of fashion. I discovered that a long time ago that I have ridden out the three waves of the music of the goth world. On top of that, there's also been three waves of fashion and they keep evolving. Now, I have closet after closet after closet filled with dark clothing, and I will stop wearing black when they invent a darker color. Until then, it is an elegant color, and it satisfies my inner being. That being said, I hope that you've enjoyed this wonderful lecture from the professor again. And to answer the question, why and how did the goth subculture survive for over 40 years? And as always, gothically yours, Professor M.